turn in your Bibles with me to chapter verse 37. Everyone's there. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, come, powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. Father, we thank you for this morning as in your word, and we would take these things and cherish them, hide them in our hearts, and Lord, remind ourselves daily as well as each other, and we would take and be used by you to represent you to this world and not walk in fear, knowing there is nothing that can separate us from your love, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I am... Um, Actually, did a similar teaching back a few months ago, maybe. There are some things there I wanted to cover, I felt like needed to be covered, and I just kept coming back to as I was preparing for this Sunday. So as we get into this, we're going to be talking about or preaching on the devil and the saints. And some people go, whoa, it's Communion Sunday. What are you doing? And the reason for this is, Often, we forget who our adversary is. And we understand our flesh and sin and our sin nature, but we forget about how he works in this world, minions. And it's important that we be on guard against him in our lives, because no matter where you go, he has influences. And when I say he's speaking of the devil, not being He's God and He's everywhere at once. He is a created being, uniquely created being in and of Himself by God. And being so, He is not omnipresent, nor is He omniscient, being knows everything. And we're going to see why He is called the deceiver, because that's what He does. He can't read the thoughts of a Christian. He can't possess a Christian. He is able to influence us through whether it be culture or side, uh, side. those things, but he is not God. He is limited on what he can do. If you take and you look in the Bible, there are about 28 titles given to him. And about two of them actually apply, kind of become have become his name. Although all of the titles are descriptive, you can call him by titles, and that would be his name. So, who is he? He's a created being. Fallen angel. That means he doesn't reside in glory. Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 make that clear to us. There's one day that the Lord calls into account the angels. And the devil comes to him as required. Tell me, what have you been doing? And I am paraphrasing. And the devil gives an account. So, seeing that, that recorded in the scripture, we know that for a fact, he is real. He is real. There's this deception in the world that the devil isn't real which fits his name, the great deceiver, in that he doesn't exist. Rather, he's a personal, he's a, uh, in personal force. Or maybe he's a concept that symbolizes what's wrong. I mean, that would be great if it was true. I mean, how often have my thoughts influenced all your life? work that way, and a personable force 
influence in our lives for our choices, such as the wind and the rain and things like that, but an impersonable force, happy thoughts towards somebody aren't going to help you at all, especially if you have no idea I'm thinking those. I, years ago, somebody told me, I'm sending you my happy vibrations. It's like, okay, bye. But he is real. And also, too, Jesus, when he is tempted in the desert by the devil, actually has discussions and the devil argues with Jesus. If this is the case, then either one, the devil is real, or two, Jesus was insane. And I think the first is true because I don't think my Savior is crazy. In this, he shows self-determination. He's been given a limited amount of self-determination. That means, in a way, he has free will. And I probably shouldn't use that word free will, but determine what he's going to do. And it's controlled by God. And we see that in the Garden of Eden, when he tempted Adam and Eve, he tempted Eve, and they both sinned, that he was showing his determination. And we also know, too, by what we're told in Revelation, that at the end of the millennial, after the thousand-year reign, with Christ on the throne and all those millions of people being born into the world under that system, that he will take and the armies of the earth against the Lord and against Israel. And you go, wait a second, an impersonable force can't lead anything. Exactly. Well, at least I was hoping you were thinking that. And so he can organize because he's intelligent. And me, he is old. And I feel like I'm old, but I'm not. Think about this. He was created in eternity before the presence of the Lord. Well, I wouldn't say in eternity. He was created in heaven by the Lord. And then he was cast out at the beginning with Adam and Eve into the garden. And so he's been around for at least 5,000 years. That's a lot more learning than I have. So if you think about that, he is pretty smart. Learned and has learned how to manipulate. He has emotions. Have you guys ever thought about that, that the devil has emotions? You think, oh, he's just filled with him. Actually, he's not. He's prideful. Pride is an emotion. Because he wants to make himself the strongest of the strong. Because actually what we have translated to us in regards to the Scripture, Strongest of the strong. Basically, stronger than the strong one, who is God Almighty. That's pretty prideful. He has desire. He has desire. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to control all things. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14 tell us that his desires are to take control, to be worshipped. And when you look at that grand scale from Adam and Eve all the way to the cross and then to eternity after new creation, you see that he wants worship. In fact, that's what he said to him is, I will exalt myself over the Lord God. I will exalt my throne over his throne. He was deceiving Eve. Because he wanted the worship. And if you think about that, after the fall of man, the whole purpose of Christ's coming is to redeem our souls. But for that worship between us. He also is wrathful. He is wrathful. He despises, he has wrath towards anything and all things that God loves. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 tells us this. Interesting that during the last 
Jesus takes and makes the statement and says to the disciples, the devil has demanded of me to sift you as wheat. Think about that gall, the arrogance, the pridefulness to demand from God. That's reassuring because that also goes with Job chapter 2. Because the devil said to God, you will not let me touch him. That's a blessing. Think about that. As a child of God, the devil God's permission. He has to go to the Father and ask for permission in order to come against us. But deception being one of his tools, takes and convinces us, and I say us as mankind, that the thing that he likes to do is, hey, I don't exist. Don't worry. But we're told to be on guard. We saints are to be, test all things. He is a master deceiver. And I say this not as a joke, but think of it. He is so good at deception, he deceived himself. Have you ever thought about that? The fact that he, in perfection and in the, in the very presence of God, said, I should be over God. I should be greater than God. He's deceived himself. His pride has done that to him. It's interesting because pride affects us the same way. It deceives us. He deceived himself, and then after he deceived himself, he deceived a third of the angels in heaven. A third of the angels in heaven by flattering them, somehow making them believe that they were better than what they were and could be more than what they were created for, that they could over Went and he deceived Adam and Eve, and he twisted the scriptures, and he caused doubt in their minds. Surely, has God said that? You could almost hear that, I don't think God really said that to you, thought, where Eve would go, I don't know what you mean, but I kind of see what you're saying. And I'm just, that's just my thoughts. That's not scriptural as far as her saying that, just so you know. And also, he deceives the nations of the earth. He deceives the nations of the earth. He takes and he, he slowly pushes things. His will, his desires, his pride, his purpose upon the world. I remember back years ago that there was um, a meeting, and I can't remember if it was the United Nations. But at that time, just it was a global meeting that the statement was made that whether or the devil, whoever could come to unify the planet, they would serve and worship. And that's the way it is. That's how the world is. God is against fun, but the devil likes fun. God is a killjoy. But the devil redeems. In fact, there are religions out there that actually take and teach that the Savior of the world was not Jesus Christ because he failed in his mission, which is why he cruci was crucified. That in fact, that was his punishment because back in the garden, he was supposed to take and knee. They could be gods, but they did that from Jesus. So the devil told them. So the devil is the savior. But again, that's deception. In false churches with the unsaved, he does that time and time and time again. And then also, Christians, he deceives us. He deceives us. He takes and he utilizes our ignorance of the scriptures to lead us astray. Think about how often the devil gets blamed for something in our lives or in the church that he had no part of. Just because we didn't like something, we take and we say, the devil did. 
just those two simple things that he can do nothing against who are the Lord's without the Lord. The children of the king. And God is on his throne, and because he is on his throne, he is in control of all things. And yes, he allows the devil limited reign with the unsaved. With the unsaved. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 for 4 tells us that. want their ears tickled. What it means is that people go looking for the things that they want to hear. I mean, I could tell you long how great you are, and you probably sit there and listen. I'm not saying that you you do that until you're annoyed because everybody loves flattery. Whether it's true or not, I could tell it to you, and everyone loves flattery. It, it's interesting when you watch people, and you could see that they know Someone's come to them, someone is about to ask something, and that someone starts to flatter them. And then you can kind of see that head, kind of like the bobblehead on the dashboard. Oh, really? Yeah, tell me more. And then they sneak in that. How to tickle ears. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, we're told that the devil... truth. He blinds the unsaved to the truth, which is why they cannot see the truth of the gospel message. Why when you go and you witness the people sometimes, they're like, well, I just can't believe that. Well, why can't they? Because their eyes have been blinded and their hearts have been hardened. Also, in the parable of the seed, the sower, he makes it clear that when those seeds are tossed, that the devil comes along and takes them away. He steals the word of God from the unsaved. As I mentioned before, he also makes the unsaved believe that he's not real. Well, that means there's no hell. If there's no hell, then no punishment, then God is an impersonal. Then Everything has just happened by circumstance, and the cosmic reality of the universe is, is that we're nothing. And since we're nothing, it don't matter. Just live, exist, and die. Why we got to tell people why they need to be saved? Because it's true there is a God. It's true there is a devil. It's true there is punishment. Now, to the saints, tears among the saints. He sows those things that are poisonous and cause problems and dissension within the church. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse eighteen tells us that of God's servants. Daniel chapter ten, twelve and thirteen. You guys remember that where. Uh, Archangel comes and says, I was to from God, but I was delayed because of the devil delayed because he can hinder the prayers of the saints. I I don't know works. Um that's chapter ten. He's called the of the saints. The one who accuses God's redeemed. How would that be? Is can you imagine? I accuse him or accuse faithful servants to his face and call. He tempts believers. Ephesians six, Job chapter two, Acts chapter ten, second. In chapter 12, he afflicts believers. And yeah, so God's permission, he can afflict our lives. So what do we do when that happens? We don't rebuke the devil. We go to the Lord. We go to the Lord. It 
did this this um, gets bay by twisting of the scriptures. I mean, how often do the scriptures get twisted? How often do we hear, judge not lest you be judged? But the Bible doesn't say that. And truthfully, and according to the word of God, there's a, 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 a love when he gets up in your face and he says that, judge not lest you be judged. Say back to them, do not twist the scriptures and be like Satan. Yeah, because that's true. That's So he also adds to the word of God, and he takes away from it. We saw that with Adam and Eve, the word of God, and he takes away. Really, if you add to it, you are taking away, because God said this, but here. And they, you push the word aside and study their word or his word, but he's still not in control. And he's given us the ability to overcome the devil. Now, this is the encouraging part, saying we have tools to overcome the devil. He doesn't have to be in front of our mind all the time. Oh, devil possessing my speaker. That buzz. You hear that buzz? <laughs> Cast the devil out of the speaker. No, there's no demon of fuzz in the speaker, anything like that. When he's given us these, this is the devil has. Remember these, folks. Three main weaknesses the devil has. Now, if you remember, Job and the Last Supper. He can do nothing without God's permission. The thing without God's permission. Second thing. He's got it. He can do nothing without God's permission. As is within a limited scope. He cannot and resistance. Resistance. It's interesting because as Christians, what does the Bible instruct us to do? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee. How do we resist? We stand on the Word of God. We constantly go back to the Word of God. You don't have that authority. Well, wait a second. No, this is a whole different study. What you do have is the Word of God, and the Word of God is the authority. Amen. You can take, and Jesus gave us the example. You say, oh, oh, you know, when those doubts come in our mind, when those things come around us, we're going on. Can you read Romans chapter 8? Read us from the God. And then also, we submit ourselves. We don't bring charges against them. Michael the archangel, he's pretty powerful. What little we know about him, pretty powerful. And if you go to the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 9, verse 9 of Jude, archangel charges against the devil. That says a lot. He says, instead, may the Lord rebuke you. You know what? I'd rather than me have to ask God for trying to rebuke the devil. Just so you know, Christ, and I let him handle all things. Another tool, because he can't stand to resist, and go, you don't have the opportunity to keep your life. You sanctify yourself. You keep those things out of your life that are impure into your life. The Word of God says, dwell in those things, the things that are righteous, holy, of good rapport. If you've got something in your life that's questionable, movies, books, TV shows, get rid of them. Get rid of them. If there's something, get rid of them. 
So if you're watching shows like, and I'm picking. agenda and we sit there and we did you see what they did to that person did you and and while i close my eyes and let my wife watch during that part you're going to subject your protector to from so all of it the plate the sword the belt Behind that shield. Greatest weapon that we have against the devil to resist him is the blood of Christ. And this is the whole crux of what I am getting to this morning. Why this is so encouraging. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ bore the full wrath of God for us for eternity, for our sins. And why? Because of his love for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that so whoever will believe in him shall have everlasting life. Everlasting. In Revelation chapter 12, again, verses 7 through 11, Revelation 12, verses 7 through 11, we're told that the saints overcome the devil by the blood, the blood of the Lamb, because we've been washed clean of the saints. When he accuses and God goes, see what's going on? Well, I see the blood of Christ. I find no fault in him. But, but, but they did this. I see the blood of Christ. I find no fault in him. It means we are not in bondage anymore to sin. Devil. Our eyes aren't blinded. Our, his, God's word is not stolen by him. Now think about this. In Revelation, where we're told about this great rebellion and Armageddon and all the devil being cast down and cast out. It's not speaking of Adam and Eve's time in the garden, not speaking about mankind, it's speaking about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. When Jesus says, which is easier to say, take up your mat and walk or your sins are forgiven? I used to go, well, one says six words and the other is this many, but it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean which is easy. It's, it's saying, or he's saying, I can take and say your sins are forgiven. But what evidence is there? And he turns and he says to the to show that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, take up the mat and go home. Party. All those who call upon the name of the would, since, and I mean essence as in this thought, we're taking up our mats and we're going to be going home. That day is coming. So we get to look forward to it. The devil is a toothless lion. He was defeated at the cross. Nothing to fear from him, but we're to be cautious. We are to take and remind ourselves on a daily basis that we have an enemy that wants to all who hates the Lord, who hates everything that the Lord is, and wants to exalt himself over the Lord, and also knowing, as Revelation tells us, that his time is short. And because it is short, he is a wrathful lion, a wrathful serpent, and he wants to destroy what he finds precious. He may seem all-powerful, but he's not. That's a deception. He may seem like he controls the world. That's a lie.
Christ Jesus. When you got saved, when did you enter into eternal life? Actually, I asked, I asked that wrong. When do you enter? Never cry out for salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ. They have already entered into eternal death. That's what we've been saying. As we read in four, there is never the and I'll end with this. Eight, verse thirty-one. Can be against us. He did not spare his own son. But he delivered him over for all of us. How will we not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who condemns, who is at the right hand of God. Tribulation? No. Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or even the sword. Just as as written, for your sake we are all we are killed all day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor, nor any other created will to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Not just this week, but why? can come between you and the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for the according to your word to bring you glory. Rightly need to have